threading issues in high performance computing. So uh, the title of this this gathering is workshop, but unfortunately we are not doing any workshop kind of activities. So I will pretend to be doing a workshop, playing a role, and then if you identify with certain roles, that you know you think about what you can do, and also please ask me any questions during the talk and. Hopefully, we can really <laughs> interactively work together as make to make a workshop, even though it, it is going to be just uh, giving you some sort of a one-sided lecture. So this is the outline of uh, today's talk. So we are scheduled to have uh, four hours with uh, breaks in between. So I will try to pace it so that we cover as much as we can at the same time, not overload you, everybody, whether you know, we will in a pause in a given point to sort of discuss what we have so far and what's next steps and so on. So this is the outline. The part one it will be somewhat general introduction about the topic we are trying to discuss today, including the applications uh, NERSC have. And I will start with uh, one application NERSC asked us to look at, which is an EMGO. And we will start as a sort of a how to do it in a sort of most uh, basic way, but go on an intermediate. And as a part two, we uh, during the part one, I will introduce uh, some concepts of OpenMP without really explaining to you. I'm going to pretend that you are experts in MPI, and you know how um, OpenMP is. It's just that you, you didn't have a time so far to actually use it. So I'm just uh, giving you, you know, head on the what you have to do knowing all these things. But of course, you know, it's not always true. So in the second part, I, I will make it talk, uh, the speaker. Yes. Speaker. Speaker, OK. <laughs> all right, so in part two, so I will go back a little bit about, you know, what OpenMP was about, mostly about to remind you what it was, and then it's cover the basic concept. Is the microphone on? Is it on? <laughs> it's on, but maybe not it's on. Um. I was shocked. So, so can people on the phone hear us? You're good. Okay. okay. How about me? So can I? Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's so maybe just speak up. Yes, I will speak up. What? I didn't get that. Okay. So I'm, I'm just trying to speak okay. up, I guess. Yes. Um, and particularly, I'd like to discuss. Uh, so I mean, it's not a new feature, but so far the performance of the runtime wasn't good enough so the, uh, for the real application use. But however, there are advancements that we can take advantage and then allow us to map our application more than uh, we can do now. So we go cover those some advanced concepts of OpenMP uh, in a more general sense. With uh, some really uh, abstract example, but with a very uh, a concrete uh, concept in it. And for the part through three, so I will go over you know, another application NERSC asked us to look at, which is a Parsec. And, all, uh, and the following is the more advanced topics regarding EMGO so that everybody can think about what they want to do for their application. So I will introduce myself. <laughs> so I'm Jung Min Kim. And I'm an engineer at Microgroup, which stands for uh, Micro uh, Mike Ramp Organization. And we, we are really. Can you can you can mute you, can on you, the, on everybody the phone? on the phone? Please mute. That sounds muted. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I have been. Oh, no, the HPC uh, HPC users since I was a student. You know, when my first research paper was actually using Intel Paragon at Oak Ridge in 1994. So I started this really computing from 1994, and I had uh, access to the SGI Origin machine, which is a shared memory machine where OpenMP was fantastic. So I started pl programming OpenMP. So 
I think in a, in a way, this topic is so familiar to me, but at the same time, I know a lot of people who haven't quite you know, figured out how to put these things together, and hopefully I can help you with that. And you know, uh, many of you, uh, you might recognize me as a scientist from Oak Ridge National Lab and also University of Illinois. And I have, have a background in the material science and the quantum electron structure, specifically quantum Monte Carlo recently in a, uh, with uh, many collaborators. So this is me, so uh, hopefully <laughs> I can contribute to you guys. So the basically, we really want to discuss how to use OpenMP for high-performance parallel computing. So we are going to talk about really high-performance and parallel computing. It's, it's not sort of a one serial code and moving that to you know, <laughs> high performance, but given the audience of NERSC, I will assume that we are going to start with the high performing parallel programming, a parallel application, mostly written in MPI, and how we are going to enable OpenMP to really further improve the performance. So let's just ask ourselves why we are even having this discussion because OpenMP has been around. As you saw, it, my first OpenMP code was written in 1998. That's 15 years ago. But why are we still, why do you need this workshop? Because a lot of people have, com uh, and then of course, you know, with the uh, new machines like Cori, the importance of shared memory programming has increased quite significantly. And everybody would have told you that you need to hybridize. You heard that enough. And also, you probably heard about this thing like OpenMP is really easy. You just find the loop and put the fragment, fragment and you will get there. Okay, that's great. <laughs> and and uh, in addition, new OpenMP4 standard even allows us to express vectorization and compilers and runtime can magically figure it out. And of course, you know, MK comes with a very good okay. threaded libraries. If you're on the phone, could you please mute? You don't have any. Mute mode. <laughs> and just to use a thread in a jam and FFT, great. But at the same time, I know you are thinking, I know that, I have done that, I never get the performance you promised. You know, my MPI code seems to run so much better. Why is it that? So let's go visit that in the question a little bit carefully. You know, I'm a physicist, it means that I only believe in laws of physics. So, I mean, of course, it's a really interest, uh, important question and very good question. Why we are having this discussion, first of all? Definitely just because that, you know, in, in the distributed computing and multi-node means that there are more things going on, you know. Electron has to move from one place to the other and data have to move from the other. And also, if you actually look inside, what MPI does, just simple call, send and receive. Underneath, there are a lot of things going on, and there are protocols MPI have to uh, be satisfied, right? And that means that there are more operations than you may not recognize it. And definitely, of course, you know, moving data instead of copying in and out will be an expensive part. So what is going on? Is it better now? Maybe you can ask if I can hear you better. Can you hear me better now? Yes, it's wonderful, but uh, can you make sure everybody mutes? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe say it again. Can, so don't say, uh, so if I hear you, that's not a good news. Can you hear me well now? Okay, so let's move on. We can hear you now. <laughs> <laughs> so. What this workshop or this uh, training in a way is really nothing but just refreshing your knowledge of hardware, software, and parallel programming you have been uh, practicing and by reminding you of what was required to do a good parallel programming to begin with. And we will use the NCEP code, EMGO and Parsec to discuss the issues we have and how we can resolve the issues and how to improve our performance. And 
the, the third is, of course, the, in, in the discussing some advanced uh, topics of OpenMP, and not everybody reads all the specs every day. So I will cover some of those essential parts. And it, at the end, I think that the, the conclusion I, we are trying to make is, yes, we can do all these things iteratively and you know, pr uh, sort of evolutionally to improve your application and hybridize quite well with the current technology. But in order to get real performance, you will come to that same conclusion that think about your code and how you want to design to go for the hard hardware we are going to have, and we have now, actually. And also think out of box to really get to the point beyond. I mean, so first of all, getting 10% and doing a lot of work is not what we are going to discuss at the end of the day. It's going to be actually speeding up your code to the significant fraction so that you do get what you invest. So hopefully that's what we can do. So I'm, I'm going to sort of clarify a few things. I'm using OpenMP in a way as a just a de facto programming model for shared memory machines. So any threading par programming, you will apply the same technique, although the semantics are different and uh, what you have to use is different, but what you have to do with OpenMP will be identical to TBB or in the P thread and whatever threading model you will have. And MPI is just a, a very standard distributed memory programming model everybody uses. And what we have to do with MPI will be also very same with any uh, programming language that have to deal with the distributed uh, memory. <laughs> and so this table is something I want you to remember. So uh, I told you that I want to, uh, well, after discussing with the organizers many steps, uh, so we wanted to make it as a workshop, interactive workshop, and with a you know, wide range of the developers involved. So here is sort of the, the, the prototype I made as a developer and what is take, uh, what will be necessary for each category and how we can sort of move up and become a FDN in the real therefore. So Dev Zero is probably, I can classify them as a new students or new postdoc to your, the research topic and just to launch your application and going to do something with the application. And Dev One is sort of a typical computer scientist who are going to work with the scientist, computational scientist, physicist, chemist, do domain scientist. However, they don't necessarily have the, all the information about theories and why they do that, why they choose particular data structure and so on. But they are, of course, excel in the computer science part. And Dev 2 is actually the, the designer of the application. You know what you're doing and why do you did that. And, the, but, you know, and also recognize that you have to do more at this point. And that will be a role the Dev 2 should be playing. And Dev three is me, because you know, uh, I think you know I can cover some of the and I can see the Dev two, and also you know, some applications I don't have any idea, and also of course the, the being a computer scientist as well, and finally will be the really the, the high, uh, really advanced level in the sense that for them performance is really everything, and whatever it takes to attain the performance will be, you know, on the table. And that could be you. And then you will do certain things. So just let's remind you of what we have now. So uh, the Edison machine at NERSC is a cluster of a shared memory machine. And we all know that, you know, each, uh, uh, the, uh, what is that, <laughs> the, the, what is it called? Is it cabinet or something? And so it contains multiple nodes, and each node are, uh, all these nodes are connected in a very complicated network, and there is a, I mean, there are topology. Uh, there is a topology involved, and then in a hierarchical uh, network structure in some cases. Although the Edison it has a homogeneous, you know, all to all kind of connectivity, and each node contains multiple sockets. That's a very standard one. With uh, each socket containing again multiple cores, and we do have this structure now. So. Basically, we have been working with uh, clusters of SMPs for a long time. Just that ev anything, just things are just the change in what that node is. Everything is pretty much the fix, 
And now it, on query system, of course, we are expecting KNL now, and then they are connected in different way. But the conceptual, uh, the, the basic building block of cluster of SMP has been around quite some time, and it will be for a foreseeable time. And of course, that is absolutely clear from even the top uh, uh, top ten list of uh, today. And you know that you know some of them have accelerators or coprocessors, but all of them are clusters of SMP. And even the laptops and phone is your SMP. And uh, in uh, uh, all these systems are just the represented or optimized solution for a given community they want to serve. And they uh, then you will be optimizing all the costs involved, but not very often <laughs> they uh, in includes the cost of development. And hopefully, but you know, I think the the community is moving forward toward the, the sort of a good solution and portable solution that if, you know what you do now will be quite useful in the the next generation and hopefully further. So let's just uh, remind ourselves why we are here and why we are talking about this one. First of all, we have a parallel machine. We have a distributed shared memory machine where parallel computing is key. And I'm not talking about just uh, doing concurrent computation, you know, just destroying a lot of, you know, searches, and those are not high performance for nurse audience. We are talking about parallel computing and parallel algorithm where things work together in, in, you know, with a maximum concurrency, but with the parallelism we have to deal with, meaning synchronization and communication. And of course, we you do parallel computers for a reason. We want to solve the problem very fast. Now, always we want the solution faster. And of course, we always want to do bigger computation, always. And then very, and also we will really strive to get a better answers than before. In, in all these three components, you know, going faster and going bigger and doing better, these are the things we are trying to do it and hope I mean, that the parallel computer uh, progression has been allowing us to do that. And in fact, uh, there is just an excellent in, uh, in, uh, uh, success stories, of course. You know, you know, we are talking about like in a million times of better com simulations now compared to, let's say, 10 years ago. But of course, high performance parallel computing is hard. If it, wasn't, if it was easy, then probably we are Having no, if not having this discussion, and we know about, of course, the also the fundamental principles of doing good parallel computing, namely, really having uh, finding good parallelism. You know, it's it's not just uh, doing trivial things in concurrent way, but finding you know meaningful parallelism, and also each parallelism have to have a right a granularity for right sort of hardware and software level, and you know, we have to continuously think about what that is and how to define the locality of the data and how not to move things too much and absolutely balancing the load. Those are really the essential things you have to do to, to, to do the pro parallel program to begin with. And we shouldn't forget that. And also, you know, you know, lastly, everything has to be coordinated. Now, it's not enough to do fast. You know, if one goes fast but the, the rest is slow, that means that you have a very slow program. Everything has to be coordinated and synchronized properly. But, and also, we are dealing with a really complicated application. So we are talking, we are going to talk about EMGO and the Parsec, and uh, I made it really, really <laughs> simple so that we only focus on certain aspects. But as a whole application, they are really complicated application. And very often, it is part of a bigger application people are using. And how do we deal with that? You know, can we make it just a simplistic or something that you just flatten everything and somehow magically do the parallelization? Probably not. When we have a complicated problem like that, a solution is probably complex as well. But the point is, in the complexity, we can control them, and also we can choose the right tool for the right, right level and do the right thing. So, so what, that's just to review what we have. So we do have a cluster of a shared memory uh, uh, node, which is represented by blue one, blue uh, box. And each box has another 
hierarchical and also complicated structure. So this is sort of a representative of uh, uh, Intel Xeon Phi coprocessor architecture with a processor, Xeon processor or socket, and the coprocessor. And each processor have a core, and nowadays also each core has a SIM delay which can execute a, a, a number of data in parallel. So we are very familiar with distributed par uh, memory parallel program, namely MPI. And what we have to do with in that case is we pretty much have to break up the problem so that each MPI can contain their own data. And of course, that means that you know it could be sockets and nodes and cores. But because we are breaking up the problem, when the problem as a whole, we need to communicate. And there is always explicit and implicit data exchange and synchronization with that one. So that's what we define as a distributed computing. And so it, in a way, this is going to be the starting point of our discussion today. And in the shared memory parallel program, of course, there are a variety of them, open MPP, thread TVP, very many, you know, customized runtime used based on P thread. So anything based on P thread, in a way, can be categorized as a shared memory program. And OpenFP happens to be the most standard and also straightforward way to exploit this shared memory parallel programming. So that's going to be our focus on that one. And of course, since like 1998, the SIMD has been going up. You know. Back then, it was like a two double was packed. Now we are talking about eight double being packed. And may, you know, 16, uh, there is going to be some issues with that. But genetically, that's just the, some, you know, the parallel lanes. What that is specifically it will depends on architecture and it will change. But the concept is fine. Uh, it will be the same. And recent, uh, very most of the time, compilers should take care of that. And then this, and uh, they do a quite fantastic job. But however, some uh, algorithms are just too complicated and compilers make so much conservative assumption, therefore the vectorization seems to be, uh, can be uh, unsatisfactory. Then of course, new OpenMP standard 4.0 and higher will allow the, the application developers to tell the compiler, go ahead, this is a vectorism, just to parallelize it. That's and of course, you, know, you can do further by using you know, much lower layer. And all these things also, are uh, also yeah. supported through the, the, the numerical libraries and system libraries. And our applications are using all this together, not just one part, and hope that <laughs> all looks will really work fine. Because our architecture itself is heterogeneous, uh, so hierarchical, and distributed plus in the shell. And trying to put everything in one frame it will work. I mean, I'm not going to suggest that MPI, your MPI code won't work. That will work fantastic in a way. But it's not the best way you can take advantage of the hardware we have. So this is the table uh, we assembled to sort of uh, address variety of HPC application nurse cares and also the, the, the next generation machines and argon and uh, uh, Oak Ridge. And you will see a, it's a big, I mean, so it is a big category from the, the announcement we can see. And as you see, it, all the codes are using MPI. There is no question about that. And, but at the same, also surprisingly, a lot of code actually use thread through the, the libraries and also explicit the threading. And of course, the language distribution is quite you know, broad. There are a lot of C and C++ code, and but uh, there is a sort of a, a some large segment of the community which use uh, mainly Fortran, and in a way, this workshop is going to be discussing that particular application class. However, this, of course, the the whole approach should be invariant whether you are using C or C++ because uh, you know what is needed to be able to use the thread well. Is the same whether you are writing in Fortran or C or C++. And sort of the, the one col two column here is sort of the what we what, what we have now. And it's kind of interesting to think about what this table tells you. 
So, uh, it's, uh, there is a one column called blues in Q. So, I asked uh, the, my colleagues at Argonne National Lab and what this code status looks like. And this is what they sort of uh, think. And uh, there are, of course, in a very optimized QCD code exists, absolutely. And the nuclear QMC, fantastic working. And so on. But a lot of codes are all ported. You know, there it is a standard CPU code, a CPU machine. And all the technology we have been discussing are useful. And in fact, they do very good on that machine. And that's good. And even the for the uh, uh, GTC code, I mean, uh, there is a some issue. So th there is a paper from the group that by converting the, the original Fortran code to C with a lot of you know, update they have to do on this machine, indeed improve the performance just vastly. And the list is, and then next to it, I put the sort of uh, the, the information uh, we have uh, as a publicly available uh, uh, links. And in fact, you know, most of the code are very well ported and, and, and also the perform very well. And the sort of the overlap between Bluesian and K and C are, is pretty high. And if you know about the blues in Q, there is a reason for that one. They all have a very similar, I mean, it has a multi-core, the same multi-core, and then the multiple hardware, uh, ma multiple hardware threads, so 16 with the four threads versus the K and C is a 60 plus something times four, 240. Mm -hmm. So the number of threads are different, but the architecture is very similar from their perspective. And what's required on the blues in Q will be quite applicable to the KNC. And what we are going to, what we have been doing on KNC will be definitely useful to Cori machine, and it will carry over. And hopefully what we are going to do now for Cori, and then you know, as uh, the, the application that are ready for Cori, we go further and then go to the Cori application. And in fact, for Cori machines, all these applications have to run very well as well. So let's go back and then go back to our first question. So, you know, many, this is a very common question I get. You know, why don't I just uh, use MPI? It's such a clean programming language. But I I will ask this question: Is it really clean programming language? Don't you have to write a lot of lines of code to do a very simple thing? So, so that's the uh, personal opinion. But <laughs> setting aside the aesthetics of the programming model. First of all, MPI it wasn't designed for shared memory machine. It is really specifically addressed the distributed memory nature of the cluster, right? It means that the solution is specifically addressed that issue. But we, we have now clusters of SMP. So it's a very new architecture that didn't exist when the MPI first was standardized. And we know that there are more nodes and more, more cores in a node and the more sockets in a node. I mean, how do you do that? And we are talking, you know, if you see some exascale kind of report, they are talking billions of concurrency, right? And so it's so an absolutely different uh, situation here. And also, unlike a simple cluster with one node, now internal cache and memory structures are much more complicated. And again, all these things was optimized so that probably high performance at a certain cost to them, it could be dollar or power. But the solution we have now just have that multiplicity and also hierarchy. Cache is shared, and when the sh cache is shared, they, share, they are shared in a very strange way too, <laughs> like in a KNC, for instance, and KNL, and all this sort of, uh, I mean, actually, even the Xeon structure on uh, machine, we will have a hardware thread running, sharing one core and, and cache. It means that what you have to do to maximize the performance is going to be quite different from what you could do on a, a simple cluster of a node. And another thing I will say is, you know, yes, I think the you know, MPI community is working very hard, and they are going to improve the MPI in, in mm -hmm. the library quite a lot. But I don't know when, I mean, we don't have that yet. so. You could wait for the magic MPI, but I, probably not because it, it's a just a too complicated problem. And the better solution will be 
understanding your application and choose to do the right thing at the li right level to actually maximize the uh, most. And because MPI was designed to address the distributed memory machine, it means that there are a lot of costs that incur when you treat the shared memory as a distributed memory system, when that's the bottom line. So you start with a distributed or partitioned view of the memory, and you try to do something. But you have a gigantic pool of memory. It means that application can actually do a lot with the, the shared memory. And if you have a sort of a, a lot of a, you know, constant data, you just constantly read off from it. And then you need, a renew, re you need to replicate it all over the nodes so that you don't do communication. All those data don't have to be replicated. It's just one data, and everybody can use it. And you just have to be in the properly protected when you write it. And of course, then, you know, because of that, you don't have to actually copy your extra copy, you know. So there are sort of, a, uh, there are PGAS languages which could handle the same shared memory aspect somehow, but there is always an explicit data in the communication that is not exposed to you, but because you just to start with the, the distributed memory computer. And of course, you know, one thing we always have to keep in mind is actual cost of MPI, you know, the object itself. You have a 1,000 MPI versus one MPI, the resources you consumed by MPI is quite different. And also the, the al uh, algorithmic aspect and then the cost of uh, executing certain uh, uh, part of the code will be very uh, different. I mean, good example is a typical collective is what it is mean. So there are great algorithms, very well optimized and shared machine and so on. But fundamentally, we are talking about the scale of in a C log C versus, I mean, core log core versus node versus node of core. There is a factor of 100 all the way to 1,000. <coughs> and just there, you are spending 10,000, okay, 100 times more just to do the reduction, you know. And that's something we have to think about it. And very often, we think in the communication will be asynchronous and overlap with the communication. Great, that is true. But what's happening underneath is, it's not going to be absolutely parallel execution of whatever in the communication you are doing. Because it, you know, we don't have a magic fabric. I mean, they are fantastic, but they are not magical. We don't have an infinite number of channels. That means that there is a, some serialization. It could be batched in a block. But nevertheless, you can't send 1,000 messages and hope every thou all 1,000 can go through concurrently. That's not going to happen. And of course, the, 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 the actual cost of MPI data abstraction as well. So just to summarize what we, we, where we are, let's just think <coughs> what application we are talking about. Most of these applications we saw in the table are originated from when the MPI really got started. And I picked the, the machine, one of my favorite machines of Creative3, Fantastic distribution and then the MPI. Let's just to compare the, the spec of Creative 3 on which a lot of these applications were initially designed and they were very uh, uh, performing very well versus the today's Cray XC30. There is a huge difference. And just let's focus on the next two column about just the comparing Edison versus the T3 about 15 years ago. We are talking quite large uh, changes. And what is striking is when you compare the changes with respect to SMP and node versus core, there is also very big differences. And of course, everything is so much bigger when you think about you know, the shared memory processor rather than just the individual core. And you know, we should be able to take advantage of that. And also, th just the ratio of the change. Think about the, uh, the peak versus the band bisection bandwidth of this. It's like in a ten f ten factor of 10. And latency is really bad, right? So once you, you re normalize your latency with respect to the call, then we are talking about more like say, it's not progression we have. We have actually a worse situation than before. 
And of course, the, and then, you know, you see compared to the, the prospect, you know, the, 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 the future machine in North Korea. We are talking about 2,000 times faster machine, about, you know, 400 times bigger memory bandwidth, collective bandwidth, if you can realize everything. But with a sort of a very, very small increase in the communication capacity. It means that we have to think about algorithms so that we do a lot of computation on the node as much as we can while the communication is regulated at the scale of node, not the code. core. So I think I'm, my pace is good. I'm, am I speaking too fast? <laughs> Any questions? Yeah, so high performance parallel computing of today has pretty much three axes. MPI, which stands for distributed memory part, the cluster part, and an open MP within a node part. And of course, now we have an increasing CMD direction. And we somehow have to deal with these three all the time. But so it is a kind of daunting task. I think you know, it is true, and <laughs> I, I really share your <laughs> fear and also the concern. But at the same time, the fr principle has been around, and it's the same one you have been practicing. It's just that we have to adjust it to the hardware we are having. And we will have, unless somebody told you this is going to be the end of the machine and there is a completely new type of m machine. But we, I haven't seen that for a long time. So. Essential part of a high performance parallel computing is actually the data. Moving data is expensive in any situation. It's much more expensive between node and between core and even the between the socket to socket and the coprocessor to processor. And of course the, the fastest is an MD. And all at each level there is a sort of a time scale involved with the data movement and the cost. We have to think about that. And each parallel level, whether it is MPI, OpenMP, or SIMD level, we have to think about, again, the, the principles of the parallel programming you, you learned in school. Finding the, the enough parallelism and doing the granularity, partitioning problem well, and particularly in this kind of architecture, optimizing the locality and data movement. This is essential, even within the same level, not just the, between the level. And another, of course, the golden rule is have to make sure that load is balanced. And doing all this coordination as little as possible, or do such that impact is minimum. And this is what you did with the MPI. And you will be doing the exactly the same thing with an open MP. And just that one extra thing is that all these things have to sub somehow work together. But I think you know, what we will discuss later on is in how we can actually break up those problems and decompose the problem or application and then put them together and you allow sort of a very adaptive uh, uh, execution of your simulation depending upon the architecture. So now that's the introduction. It, it's a little bit long, but I think it's quite essential that we think about those things that, you know, sort of <laughs> went to back, you know, you, you forgot. I mean, we don't think about these things all the time. But when you make the transformation and when you take time to do the transform with the OpenMP, definitely that's, this is the right time to think about that and then do the right thing at the parallel programming level. So how do we do this OpenMP parallelization with MPI? And in a way, I don't think it's a unique for OpenMP workshop. It's going to be really generally applicable to uh, any parallel programming that we have, and uh, any development decision we make is we have to set the goal right. And also, we have to define what kind of performance we are expecting. Do you really need the performance like 90% uh, of the peak for your application all the time? But probably not because uh, you have other priority. You have to do the science, not just the writing, uh, writing the code that runs fantastic all the time. So definitely that's the kind of performance you expect 
and how what uh, the performance you want to achieve so that you can actually do your science you know, the better than before. <coughs> and of course, that and the, the performance goal is also what type of application you want to develop. Are you really trying to make the code run at an extreme scale so that you know instead of uh, an hour you want the second, maybe so, at the co at using thousands of uh, hundred thousands of nodes? Maybe that's your goal, then there will be a difference. And or you will be just the same, you know, I want to do much bigger problem when I understand what kind of a performance I expect on this scale, and I want to be able to scale that out to a bigger and bigger problem. That's very different, but you know, the solution will be different at the same time. But definitely prioritizing those are very important. And you could be those uh, people who want to do everything, then you know, then you, that it, it will take much more effort, but you know, the reward will be also greater. And definitely, with the, the, the goal you set, you have to prioritize, okay? If your priority is really getting performance and performance, performance on any architecture you are going to yield, you will do anything you can do. But very often, of course, we will be optimizing certain pr in the variables in our research pr in, or development issues. Definitely performance is important, and that's, that's why we are talking about high performance, not low performance parallel programming. And at the same time, portability is extremely important. You know, you don't want to work so hard on core and it turns out you can't run on core machine or next to core too. That, that's really not a good idea. And at this, uh, when you make this kind of change and make the code run better and portable, that's fine. But if the code becomes so difficult to use by the other new developers and so, that might be the ideal solution. And all these things to factory, and of course, you know, what kind of allocation you have, those things. But so you will set the priorities. And the, the, the last thing will be also understanding what you are, you know, what your skill sets are, and what the performance we can achieve within that parameters. And then depending upon the, the and also the community you are working. You know, if you are working in a community where there are a lot of good high performance library developed by the community, and all you have to do is really write a high level code. That's very different. But you are a very small community when everybody writes their own specialized application, then the solution will be quite different. In any case, depending upon the level, you will choose different paths, but the, the, the approach will be the same. You will do the incremental changes to get the performance better from the bottom, which is often called evolutionary in our group. And the other one is, at some point, these little changes at the bottom won't give much of the boost. And you can end up spending a lot of time trying to squeeze like a few percent of a performance. At that point, I think you have to think, is there some fundamental things that is stopping us from getting the real performance? And we have to revisit the fundamental design of the code and also algorithm and how they are implemented. It's one thing to have an algorithm or the theorem of uh, in, uh, from the computer science sense, but it's very different when you actually put it on the, the machine and uh, implement it. Whether the implementation is sound or maybe something were not taken care of uh, very well, then we need to look into that. And of course, you know, it's going to be very iterative process and so on. So, in any cases, if, if at any level we have, the, f the first thing I want to start with is I'm, so all this discussion beyond this point, I'm going to assume this one. We have practiced the best programming practices we know of in its own way. Yeah. Doing the right, you know, protecting your variables so that, you know, it is in constant so the compiler can just do focus on reading fast versus uh, not letting be confused by, oh, maybe I have to do the right carefully. <laughs> and alignment from the beginning, thinking about how we do that, and removing unnecessary branch. You know, there are a lot of code you will naturally, you know, when the code grows, it got sloppy. It's very common. 
And first thing we have to do is just pruning the code so that we have a clean code to start with. Doesn't matter if it's MPI, Stadia, OpenMP code. That's the first thing. And I'm assuming that you have done that. And now, we make sure that the data is actually well partitioned and well distributed and yeah, also designed depend and for the architecture you are working on. Unfortunately, architecture is so complex, pretending that that's just a simple architecture we were familiar with 10 years ago, is just not going to work very well. I mean, it will work, but it won't work very great. And I don't think we are talking about just working fine. We are going to be really trying to make it work very well. So there are two things about data. So if they, in fact, the, it sounds like a very contrary thing. Because I told you that, I'm going to tell you that, maximize the shared memory. So share as much as you can. <laughs> because you have a big shared memory, you can explore it. And you want to get rid of all the redundant data, and, look, and you just share as much as data. But you also have to maximize the the, the, the memory distribution as well. So, meaning, you know, MPI has a very great part in, in the property that because nobody knows what you own in the process, it means that data is well protected and that is very localized to the MPI task. Where we have, the memory is allocated within the process and we own it and we can optimize it. Very often when we do the OpenMP, we forget that that ma doesn't matter anymore. So even though we are going to maximally use the shared memory, we also have to think about the, the, the aspect of the memory distribution. We want to make sure that data is evenly distributed so that the, the no particular path is uh, exhausted. And also, we talked about cache of uh, so having quite interesting structure nowadays, you know, L1 and L2 cache is private. What that means is if we can da uh, cache the data per thread or per local, you know, per, per thread, that means that we can really maximize the, the uh, data use. So we, these two have to be really, really th thought through very carefully. So in, in I think in the, we will all be agree the parallel programming in a way is about the data and making sure the locality is maximized so that we can do computation in parallel very quickly using the data we, we need to access while keeping all this constant data around. And in particular with the OpenMP, so the seemingly simple semantics of OpenMP can be quite you know <laughs> misleading to some degree from the person, anyway, so the, the good thing about MPI in a way is that unless you say send this one, receive this data, they don't talk to each other. And MPI doesn't do anything beyond your bed. At least you said, I want to send this data and I want to receive the data and I want to reduce the, this data. You say it and the MPI will do it. They will never do anything behind you. Although each line of the call can be quite <laughs> expensive, a lot of instruction, but they don't do anything if you don't say to do it. However, OpenMP, being the programming model of a fork and join, there is a hidden operation. Just a very simple line of a program parallel do actually does way more than you think. So in that sense, and also you know, often some runtime will create and destroy the threads you know, whenever you encounter that uh, thread reason. That is not free. I mean, it is very tiny, and it's get, get going down all the time, but it's not zero. It means that you have to think about what each line is going to cost you. And also, I mean, and with that, it's always this, uh, but the rule of OpenMP to enforce the cache coherence and all that means that there is implicit synchronization and barrier with just the simple problem. So we just have to think about the cost. So MPI, we know when I write this one, it costs something. But very often with OpenMP, we don't think about it, but we should think about it. So any excessive use of you know, synchronization clause or you know, barriers will be costly. 
so making sure that your code changes such that minimizing this thing will be very critical. And of course, the cash currency has the, uh, the cost. And there are sort of a, uh, uh, in somewhat sort of a, uh, intricate things you have to think to make the code correct. But that's, an, uh, that's something you have to keep in mind, and it is always have to be uh, maintained. And the other big issue is about the force sharing, particularly with the big and the long case uh, line zone and right, read write conflict because lang uh, the standard does itself doesn't prevent you from doing that. While with the explicit programming model, you, you can't do it because there is no mean to do it. So be aware of this particular case with OpenMP and try to avoid that one and then we can sort of move forward. So shall we take a break about five minutes or 10 minutes, five minutes? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we are back and let's start the real. I see. Ah. So we are back. Oh, it was off. So now let's discuss the actual application and what's involved and what to think about to uh, use OpenMP for the sort of the goal we set. But of course, you know that's another uh, sort of point I have made before of this uh, break was that we have to decide what we want <coughs> and how much we really want to be able to do that. And there are certain things we have to do to in order to achieve different goals, and we will sort of discuss that. So the part one is, I'm going to assume that I'm the dev zero or dev one, I mean, which was the starting point anyway, because I didn't know about EMG or code. I Googled it, that's about it. And it taught, so, so what do we do? And you will have a new students, a new postdoc, and you know, you, you want to get into new application. <laughs> what do we do? First thing is, of course, know your application. That was important. So before even said, in order to set the proper goal and the proper plan, of course, it means that we have to know what we are going to work with. And luckily, the code distribution come from the sky was has a fantastic readme file. So even though, so we actually we spent about a week just to doing the experiment without reading the readme, and later I found that. Oh, everything we discussed was written in the readme file. So if you are dev0 and dev1, ask the documentation, get, you know, ask for the readme file to get started. It's very helpful. And it explains to you what the code is. It's a Fortune 90 pure MPI code. Oh, great. And even describes you what the hotspot is, which we are supposed to discover with the wonderful tools we have. And, and it says, it's going to be most of the time spending QMR. And then you, you, know, you know what, you mean. most of people know what QMR will be, and I will explain to you. And it, it's in this file. How more <laughs> can you ask? And it spends 90% of work clock time. And further, it even explains you what kind of sparse matrix vector multiplication you're using. So you adopt a particular format, ELAPEC, designed for mostly for the, the vector machines. Great, and even the line number. So we had a lot of information about the application. Go to another, you know, and then it is a finite difference method. It means the operation required to do the finite difference method is sort of well documented. So we can definitely uh, electromagnetic imaging. So it is what the EM is supposed to, it means. And you can do even multiple parallelism. We have a finite difference method and then multiple finite difference problems. So it means that you take many nodes and break up into multiple MPI groups, and then you can do MPI or some other way. I mean, it could be one MPI running multiple uh, instances of that one. And the most important thing, the document says, it, it used the data decomposition of I times A times K. Even the input file tells exactly what the decomposition is. Now we have a really good starting point, and also very helpful. Uh, the, the the developers Scott and even the Michael who is sitting in this audience. So knowing EMGO 
if you are really, I mean, in any application, you have to know what you are going to work with and what is the key part of the code. And if you don't know what they mean, it means that we have to discover. And let's say we want to discover that even though readme file has a very good uh, uh, description. So for this part, we are going to set the goal to be this. It is a very good MPI code designed for blues in L. Uh, that was the initial uh, code port information I obtained. So our goal will be, since we are going to use MPI, with a, uh, on, uh, I mean this code on machines like Cori and Edison now, what the goal is, is that, and then also there are some indication that the, uh, at the scalability beyond certain point is not perfect, or, you know, so there are some rooms to improve. Mm -hmm. And based on our sort of assumption that physics tells us that doing less MPI on a node will be helpful. So our goal will be less to obtain the, 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 the sustainable performance, meaning the performance is either better or at least equal with the, or, or of this input file using any number of MPI tasks and open MP thread. That was our goal, and we will try to achieve that. And, but because the particular way the uh, EMGO employs the data partition, uh, and the, the data we got, we only can run certain number of uh, you know, the MPI processes. So in that sense, I couldn't, we couldn't just do, do everything we can possibly do. But in a way, that's good because we can define what are the sort of the, the, the matching points we want to meet by doing this exercise. So workload was well classified as a different directory with the name, there's a P number of MPI, IJK indicating the data distribution, and the last number is supposed to be the, the data parallelism you talked about. So there will, the EMGO can use one data point or multiple data point, and also at this point we will be discussing what is the best way to do that. So that's another topic, but we are go not going to touch that. So there are those four directories we are have to deal with. So, so one means one MPI, four, eight, and then so. And clearly it indicates how the, the structure uh, data is partitioned. So first thing is not knowing the, the fantastic readme, we have to establish the baseline. And also, if we want to achieve something, we have to know what the baseline is so that we can measure our success or failure and how we are making the progress. So important thing is establishing the baseline that is really relevant and also <coughs> that tells you what we have to look for. So that's going to be one big so. So I'm going to discuss those two steps. And based on the baseline information and analysis we got with the written file, now we are going to see what we can do from the bottom one. We are dev zero and dev one. We are not touching the, <laughs> the we can't come from, I mean, I can't tell, you know, Michael, do, do this, you know. Meaning, we have to understand what is implemented and how we are going to do with OpenMP. So that's going to be our goal. So here is the baseline performance we uh, obtained on Haswell. Quad 18 core machine. It's an insane machine in the sense that one node has 72 cores, and with two hyper-threading, it's like 144 threads. So one node is like, you know, at least 64 nodes of a send, and some, some equivalents of that one. So, and then, of course, if using this machine makes it a little bit easier for me to analyze the data and then do a lot of it in, <laughs> in, in the work scene. So it's an insane machine, but as a lot of people assume that this is going to be prototype of a KNL, which could be from the perspective of number of cores you have to deal with, the number of threads we have to deal with. In that sense, it is pretty, looks similar, and probably even the peak performance per node comes out to be well effective. I mean, so there are, of course, big difference because it has a much higher clock speed and everything. In that sense, it's not one-to-one, -one, but characteristic could be very similar. So if we can manage to run four MPI on a node to be able to run one MPI per socket and use the, as many cores as possible, then, then we are pretty much done. And of course, in the considering that there are ways of partitioning the node to eight, which is not you know, forbidden, we will be able to do that experiment as well. So in this experiment, we choose to use a sort of a, the best optimal way to run MPI code. 
of MPI on of this curve, meaning starting from single node, and then when we have a four node, four MPI, we are going to pl place the MPI for each node, so that you know each MPI can pretend to have a, its own node in a, in all day. Okay. How does the we are going to get to that. That's the whole exercise today. <laughs> yeah, so just going on. So, so here at this point, we didn't do anything because the code is a pure MPI. It's not calling any MKL, not calling any libraries. It means that there is the only way to implement OpenMP is actually go into the code and change it to do that. So we haven't done that. So we, this is the original code. Let's see what we have and what the characteristic of the code is and how we can improve that. Because uh, the, the whole point about the knowing your application and setting the performance goal and actually target means that you have to understand what the code does and how it behaves depending upon how you run the code and how you scale out and so on. So it's very important for you, for us, I mean for non-developer, that too. Except for dev too, we all have to do this step. We have to run it and see what happens. And even probably dev too, uh, when you get to a new machine, probably you want to do it again because different machines behave so differently. So in this case, what we have confirmed is that readme was right. You know, there is a only one routine that shows up as a hotspot, which is the the QMR. You know, and then. So on. And then, yes, the, the, the domain decomposition is playing, which is very clear from the MPI communication, the statistics you get. And, and also, the memory footprint, based on the analysis, gives you constant memory, which means that data is fully distributed. There is no replication, almost zero. And uh, overhead is purely coming from just the doing MPI. So that's good. And excellent scaling. So as you can see, even super scaling. This is one of the, s the rare s super scaling code I have seen for a while. And definitely great. And then eight is almost ideal. But I would say 64 is not 64. And then you, know, you may think, oh, maybe the code is not well designed. At this point, you have to understand what it means having using all the codes in your <laughs> machine. When you have a MPI per socket, it means that the memory is well distributed, and you are not really exercising. S you don't have any hot path for the memory access or MPI. While 64 level, we are talking really, really busy core. Everybody is uh, competing for the same resource because the memory channels are limited. It's not 64. It's uh, like eight, or depending upon the machine. It means that they are competing. Therefore, there is always a cost for that one, unless your code is really just doing in-core, in-cache, in a computation. There is never going to be the perfect scaling. So in that sense, considering all those com uh, constraints, this is really, really, well, in a bad, a good the MPI code. Every part scales well. There is no in a serious part that doesn't go away. It's just everybody is going down. And of course, in a Still, it is MPI code, and at the level of 64 MPI, you do start seeing about 10% keeping spending in MPI. And then it happens to be all reduced. And in some sense, it received, but mainly through the all reduced because QMR really requires a lot of reduce of scalars. So let's do you know, the, the things you should do. It's a really, you know, this is the first thing you do. Open up your analysis, run the uh, amplifier, and look at the V2. And because the QMR is only dominant one, you have to do some special trick that you have also want to add loops, functions and loops. So there is a little, uh, in the uh, amplifier, you, there is a little button so, so that you can see the loop. So if you look at the, the profiler, as you can see, there are multiple loops, but all in QMR. Right? And then with the certain characteristics. So the first loop shows up as the first one. And depending on, so this case was the serial run, but if you do the same analysis with the 64, uh, the profile looks similar, not very different, although you know, the, the actual you know, size will be very different. And 
So that's good. So it means that, yes, the readme was absolutely right. All we have to think first is to look at the QMR part. Let's look at it. And indeed, when you open the file, it all looks like that. There is a do loop with some number n. And you know, you can easily figure out what an n is through the profilers and even just to print out again. And then there is a pattern, there is a loop, and it's very often it's, you know, divided by all radius. That's what the camera, which I didn't write down the mathematical one, but so all loops are the same, so it's good. And just to looking at the data, uh, at least the code, on the left-hand side is, is uh, with the uh, indexed by I, I, meaning there is no data conflict. It's like a streaming, so everybody gets something or do something, but at the end only write in a specific place. So that's good. So <coughs> that's that just says okay. This is really something we can parallelize with OpenMP. So this is the yes, putting program actually works. And but of course, you know, we have all radius and there is all radius is there for some for real reason. You just don't put all radius without thinking what you are doing. It means that we have to be careful with, the, with all the variables that are going to be reduced every stage. Except but otherwise it's very straightforward case. Okay. So right now, yeah, this yeah. one is, uh, I believe, is uh, 64. Okay. This is, uh, so the combine is 11 seconds, so I remember the time. So, so but the shape the, is, is just the scaling back and forth. And the loop scaling is pretty much st straightforward. So what you have seen here is you know, it could be just one loop. So this is what the code looks like. And QMR stands for cosine minimum rigid method. It's one of the cradle of a space server method. Very, I mean, so you, you can ask the, the developer what they do. But code looks very much like that. And then, in fact, readme tell you there is a step which do something. Looks somewhat complicated, but essentially, it is just doing some reduction. So there is a big loop over i and do something. And uh, there is a partial uh, computation of a C sum. Because C zero means uh, complex zero, and the good thing, uh, so being a dev of being me, dev three, <laughs> there is uh, some special meaning because I can tell from the variable and function name what they mean. <laughs> because uh, it, it scientists do the same thing, so everybody has probably C zero somewhere, but you know that's a sort of a joke. But <laughs> anyway, so it's a simple routine, and then you do it, and you can see that CGA as has uh, some indirect indexing. That's the only complication in this case. Then, uh, otherwise, it's pretty straightforward double loop case. Fine, and then you do reduce our uh, D sum, right? And then, is it this? Uh, actually, A Y. So there's something happening. So fine. So it means that you are doing some reduction on uh, the, the one single value, and then you are updating the vector in parallel. And then the next loop is like very similar to many like this one. So you will do some assign, take the differences, and uh, compute the, 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 the lab product of the residue. I mean, so this I can is. Say something for uh -huh. so that's MTX is a matrix, and CGS is a solution. Of yeah. That's what the code does. A lot of applications of big matrix A multiplied by a vector X. Exactly. And yeah. Thousands of times doing one geophysical imaging. Thank you. So, so now I'm. Um, so we are ready to do OpenMP. It is really straightforward. So literally, you are going to put OMP parallel do reduction because uh, AY was reduced. That's the only value that is being reduced, and every ad other thing is actually product. Uh, and so there is a C sum, right? And then there is assignment to CBK one. So it means that we have a right hand side which is a solution we have f from the previous step or something like that. And then you're going to update it with a matrix multiplication. Fine. So this is it. it that's actually what it is. And it's exactly what just Mike said. It's this standard sparse matrix vector multiplication and all the complexity of the sparse matrix <coughs> hidden in the index scheme and how the MTX is represented. But I mean, so but let's ignore all this really in, in 
the essential part, but from the pure computation part, that's what it is. And it's usually a computable one. And the only thing, but you will notice one thing about the private. So I declare some variables to be de uh, private so that each thread does use their own, uh, have their own data. Why? Because you realize that C sum is set to zero and accumulated and assigned to a new vector. So there is no reason to exp you know, C sum is the private data. And of course, and the, the index about the column and J internal loop is, of course, is per thread. This does shouldn't be shared. So that's the gotchas in a way, but something really basic. So you re recognize what you have to actually compute as a reduction type and privatize as much as you can so that you know, every thread performs its own. This I'm sorry, can we go back to see what is the time used for the NPIR reduce there? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there, there. So there is a, I didn't put it there. Yes, exactly. So it means that if we achieve the goal, uh, we, we can sustain the performance even though MPI is nothing, I mean, that's good, right? So just imagine if you want to scale this problem to multi-node, and you will get completely swapped. So this is a very, I mean, it's still very, very good code. I mean, there's nothing I can say, but, but then nevertheless, on the other end, it's about 0.5 seconds. So 10%, I mean, it's actually the profiler will tell you 10% is actually spin on MPI. So it's not zero. So if you, if you are running this <coughs> thing, this code on KNC, for instance, I wouldn't have any MPI reduce. Why would I reduce? It's everything is just a copy, a assignment. So I should have a zero MPI. See, I, I have a, a little bit of difficulty to understand you when you talk about the scaling uh, at the 64 mm -hmm. the I mean, off from the idea of scaling, and the reason is MPI. No, you know, it's a, no, I said it's about memory, it's sort of a resource contention, uh, like a shared yeah, code like memory. But, you know, it's a MPI did not, I mean, temper is nothing, and uh, I agree. Okay. MPI in this case, I don't even, I, I think it, it just shows MPI is not the problem. It's okay. more yeah, about what you have as a shared memory. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, so I didn't mean that. So <laughs> this one is nothing to do with the MPI problem. MPI did fine. Absolutely, <laughs> there is no big problem. But but definitely, just because you are using all the cores, basically, you are really saturating the memory bandwidth and the core and you know, everything you can pass. It. So we are probably reaching the bandwidth. Yeah. <laughs> is this cross matrix uh, distributed? Yes, it is distributed, that. absolutely, because uh, not only so, n is it's going to decrease with the number of MPI. So that's that's the key. So itself shrinks. So n itself is partition. So you can actually see the number and then multiply. Ah, it is one number. And I guess you have typo then. It's, it's C sum instead of D sum. Ah, right? uh, no, actually, C sum is a private. And then this sum is the, 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 the value Michael used in the code. So I skipped a lot. So it's just that uh, a possibility, yeah, no, 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 there is, a, so this is actually written. So in that sense, I, you know, if you are sort of going for the really sort of a maintainable code and sort of clean code, this code could be just removed as a or reduced AY and somehow internally we can decide. So that's just the really, really, cosmetic things, but no, no, it's, it's not the same. This sum is not the same as C sum. C sum is a complex sum, which is a temporary value within the loop, while this sum is going to be the value reduced through or uh, reduced. That's yeah, the. Yes, you skipped something between the Oh, yeah, yeah, there are big codes, so. Right, <laughs> I'm I sorry. <laughs> Absolutely, no, no, so, so A, so I think in a, in a way, it is following standard uh, portfolio naming scheme that, you know, A and, you know, up to R is rear or something, so. <laughs> yeah, so, so, I'm sorry. So, there is a much bigger part because uh, you saw about five loops, and then it's about, like, you know, more than 100 lines of the code. But you can pretty much grab four loops, no problem. And we did that, good. 
And then now next step is like uh, some loop like looking like this one. Again, it's a easy case because it is, again, very protected. The only difference here in this case is going to be better being reduced. Otherwise, it's pretty much the same routine. And the left-hand side is definitely protect protected. So, you know, even you, so you read two vectors, you take the difference, and do the dot product. That's about it. And once you do it, this is so sort of a summary paper from uh, Vtune. So the left-hand side is before making any change. So we run Vtune with a 64 call uh, by aligning them. So, so this is what the, the analysis said. And as you can see, MPI doesn't show up at all, right? It's all the top loops is are there, exactly the same one. The sum rule and the CPU tie. So once you apply the open MP transformation or change little in editing, we just did, this is what we get. So basically, so the runtime doesn't look great, but at the same time, to pay attention to the difference too. So I ran 64 MPI. In this case, we are using four MPI, each MPI sitting on socket. It's a quad core, and I'm going to use only half of the cores. I mean, it's, it, uh, uh, so eight threads per the, the socket. So I'm not, so I'm being f fair and unfair at the same time in that sense that from the OpenMP perspective, I'm not, set, I'm not using all the cores, so there are some uh, less pressure on the memory possibly. But I'm using less MPI because then you know you will have a different proportion. And good news is, in fact, it recognizes a parallel region which says this much, and they even tell you that how much I can gain if I work very hard. Well, we work very hard, and there is about you know, 0.5 seconds we can get fine. And then the loops are very well parallelized, and it even tell you how much we can gain per loops. Excellent. <laughs> but nevertheless, so far it looks good. And the results are correct. We could verify how many iterations it took and the accuracy it achieves and so on. And of course, you recognize that this red spot about the serial time is 4.5 seconds. It's huge. So do we have an under slow problem? Because, uh, you know, but don't forget that we just touched one routine. And even though 90% time is spent there, but we still have a 10%, and that 10% is going to do something because that much work is much less with the 64. So it's about one eighth of uh, 16 of that. You know. So it means that it's not real MDOS law, it's just MDOS law of a lazy person that we didn't just do it. But on the other end, already, first thing is let's see how much we can do for the things we worked on. I mean, apparently, performance is quite encouraging. In this case, another thing is I didn't have to change anything. Because OpenMP is a flexibility in a way, we could just use not just this, uh, the eighth thread, we could use ninth thread or 18th threads, however threads we have. So that's the kind of a flexibility we have we can exploit. So that's, that's one thing, that hard data partition that was necessary to make sure the MPI works very well is not actually critical as some, but it can be critical, and you can actually do much better than that. But from sort of a fourth step perspective, it's really nothing. And in fact, it, that's what you see. And so our V2 expert uh, recognized that I have an unknown <laughs> line. So if you put the parallel source info dot equal in the compiler flag, then you will even tell you where to look at. So that's there. So good. So I think you know I'm you know we I mean we are talking about dev zero and dev one. So we achieved something. And it looks like you know since considering that that whole routine was uh, very scalable <coughs> with an MPI. It just meant that it's not, a, it's not a parallel problem. It means that that's definitely something we can parallelize. It's not a, a hard serial barrier. So if the, the mentality I'm sort of telling you is that MPI can do it, so why not open MP? I think that's quite fair. And based on the performance number of 64 MPI and the serial section we can obtain, and then the other one, I can predict that we will have a 11.5 a second. So that's about 8% gain over the existing MPI. So that's pretty much what you expect just because MPI is, you, know, you are talking about 
you know, 4 MPI versus 6 to 4 MPI. And the point of all videos is that you have to call the same number of time, but each call gets expensive when you have more MPI. And so that's pretty clear you see that one. So now, this is time to talk to Dev, and luckily we have Michael here. That, and if he says to me or to us that, what is the point? We are talking about 8%. Is that all we can do then? I mean, it could be so, so insignificant, maybe it's not worth it. Our counterpoint is that, yes, it might not be a big deal on this machine, but try this one on KNC or KNL. You will see huge difference. And of course, the, the better of, uh, of uh, 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 in the scenario we are seeking, of course, is that is quite okay. I mean, it's very really interesting. It's doing something that is promised or at least advertised. But we just to prove that we it just didn't do all videos, you know. <laughs> it's just a physics law. So, it, but it's not actually getting me any performance boost. I mean, eight percent is not the performance I'm going to go for. Therefore, at this point. Yes, we have to think about what to do. So part two is, of course, now we have uh, done the, the basic thing we can do and indeed get something done. And we actually have obtained the, the performance. Now let's think about how far we can do. So now we have to go back and see what actually is going on. So now I'm looking at the, the analysis of 16, uh, so running 4 MPI, 16 in a thread. So I'm going to profile only one MPI because all so MPI is well balanced. There is no hot spot. There is no no imbalance whatsoever. Of course, that's the design. So we can focus on only one MPI uh, rank in this case, running 16. First thing you will recognize is that it's at least the part we just parallelized don't have serious load imbalance. I mean, we didn't do anything extra, but so we managed to be able to run every thread very busy. I mean, there are some red spots, and of course, at the end, there are, I mean, there is a s tiny bit of a serial section <coughs> which looks like, but it's so insignificant, we are going to skip that part for a while. And then maybe to really advance the algorithm, we may have to look at it. But nevertheless, that's not going to be the major problem. And of course, the main problem is the first part that you know it is taking now too much time compared to the rest of the code. But again, it's not really serial bottleneck. It's not uh, just that we didn't paralyze it. And in fact, if you zoom, I'm sorry. If you zoom in the section and the filter with the functions and loop again, then that's what you get. It tells you that definitely there are only again two routines, which is which is where actual MTX and all these sparse vectors are constructed. And then there are multiple loops, and then it tells you the prior uh, the, the the loops you have to focus on. Now, based on that, now we are going to do the same thing. It's a really a step-by-step, iterative, and incremental approach we can do. In this, now, I'm going to get rid of a serial bottleneck, because it's, it wasn't really serial bottleneck. It's just that somewhere we are just uh, doing the partition properly. And it turned out, thanks to the analysis and also tracing, so this turned out to be the kind of loop we have to parallelize. There are triple loop, so it's a three-dimensional problem. And then the, the partition is such that we've divided the cube or the some uh, structure into equal partition. So dim is a vector that defines how many, you know, each MPI has to take care of it. And it turns out that's how it looks like. And again, it's just a triple loop. And it looks like left-hand side is also very unique, meaning everybody's doing something, but at the end it's just writing something to a uh, index fund and the empty MTX. That turned out to be the case. Then of course this is the kind of thing you can easily proceed to do, and it's actually what I did. <laughs> and this is a parallel loop, but these trip loops can be collapsed, meaning from the OpenFP perspective, all this uh, 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 three-dimensional space can be handled as a whole, 
and then we can actually paralyze as a whole. So there is a collapse we can do. And of course, we have to be careful about the private in this case, because it turned out Enroll and Enroll 2 has been incremented inside of the loop. That means that do we do lock and do, do we do atomy? But no, because the by construction, that index is just computable property within the parallel reason. So what we can do now is make that to be private and introduce a simple function that can actually compute the starting role, and then within the role, you can just uh, compute it. So depending upon how you want to do it, there are many ways to do it, but nevertheless, the, the concept is there. Once you do that, <laughs> unfortunately, the result was a disaster, not a number, because uh, it looked like a very simple parallel routine and what's going on. And it turned out there were sort of uh, very well-known gotchas from uh, just uh, by construct, I mean, it's really a very, very well-known documented feature of the OpenMP problem, that common block and hidden dependency from the modules and the fortune common block. Oh, okay, I told you that I'm a deaf. There is a reason why I separate myself from the rest of the developers. I'm not a Fortran programmer, and I don't remember these things anymore. So it means that there is a, some things to be done. However, the point is we have tools for that, and the, the threat checker or advisor will tell you that you have a data conflict, and you have to privatize this data properly. And also, of course, Dev1 and Dev0 Anybody who knows Fortran can easily fix those problems. And I think, you know, once you do that, I think we are pretty much good to go. And I didn't complete it, but I think that we should, we sh maybe it's an exercise we can do. But at the same time, when you just look at this loop, now I'm thinking, it looks so familiar. It's a grid, in a 3D grid, stencil problem. There are so many of those applications. Yes, it is different because it's a complex and, uh, and all that, but nevertheless, it's just like n n another extensive problem operating on grid. It means that this routine can do so much and really capture all the necessary performance enhancements one can do to make sure that actually the, the sparse matrix vector multiplication runs very well with the automatic, you know, thing. so this is where we have to think about how we can do better and redesign it. And I think, you know, it's just a more general question, so about, you know, actually the, the uh, yeah, like pack format itself, that's something we have to evaluate, is uh, it is intended for uh, the, the vector machines and so on, and also there are some limitations back to many, as when you, the force, the, this, algorithm was implemented, po quite possibly com compilers were not quite the same. There are very different issues we have to deal, and so on. And also data is how, even just the ordering issues. Even when you call the, the routine, they can uh, order it, the index is very differently. But depending upon how you do it, it will be very high performing vectorizer we call versus the other one is just going all over the place and scattering it. And, the, the, and then limiting the bandwidth. So that's really something we should think about because it's not just a naive uh, open and before it that will work. You have to do very well. And how to actually enable SIMD better. So I just say, oh, it's a triple loop, let's collapse them. Uh, it turned out probably collapse three is not the best way to do it. Because we do have a long vector, and we want to be able to vectorize those things very well. And you saw it, every routine is just a simple linear axis most of the time. That means that probably more likely the collapse to is better, meaning we parallelize outer loop, but inside is per thread, if they are contagious. That's contagious, so that's something. And also we just have to question, there are, you know, the, why are we using the index routine in this way? And then the in the in all this the auxiliary data we are introducing to solve this sparse matrix. Like this. I'm not suggesting it was the wrong solution, or I think you may well need the solution anyway. But at this point, we will have to think about whether there is a very a good alternative that we can enhance the performance. And and definitely, it is a really good time the serial discussion we can do and actually do the, the really good design. But nevertheless. The fourth step can be pretty much done. 
So I will make the projection of EMG own code just based on the things we can do easily at this point. It will work really fine. Better than what you have now, and you will get good performance. You can use multiple MPI, you know, no problem. You can do one MPI if that's memory problem. So when you have application with a very good data distribution without any big memory demand with respect to MPI, that means that you should use MPI up to a point. And just to make sure that, that you don't use too many MPI so that MPI takes over. So that's something you have flexibility in on this architecture. That you will use, let's say, four MPI per node, and then try to do it. I mean, often that is better because the MPI, I mean, there is a multiple channel. I mean, the MPI is not stupid either, so you don't have to serialize every MPI. So there is a multicasting issues and multipath possibility. So having multiple MPI, if there is no problem in memory, fine. But just that you have to understand the cost of MPI and then try to reduce as much as you can. So that's, you have that one, but is this one thing we can just uh, turn on or not? And of course, you know, the definitely without doing anything, only thing we did was put the OpenMP program and just to make sure that the compiler does the proper uh, or maybe all three actually, and then architecture optimization. It turned out everything was just factorized. There was nothing we had to do. And the good point is, really, there are enough parallelism. So number of grid we are talking about per node was like uh, 57. I mean, so if you multiply, then we have plenty of parallelism. That means the load balancing is, of course, very easy. So collapse to review. And again, there is no serial hard bottom there. We don't have to worry about that. It's just that doing the OpenMP correctly. And once we did, I think we will be fine. But can you work great on, you know, Cori uh, uh, and also future Mark system? Because we are suggesting Dev to think over and then change the code, not just to cosmetically changing. And I think it is. I mean, I don't see a fundamental reason why not. But probably we want to be able to sort of uh, do proper things so that at the design level, we can actually fix the problem and then do the right thing. So I think at this point, so we started with a very simple goal. We are just matching MPI, good parallelism, or M open MP is just doing less MPI. But I think that goal is just too low. I mean, this code should be able to do way more just by really recognizing some architectural issues and then try to modify that. So we are going to reset the goals and hopefully we can actually do it. See, just what it means is we are just to doing the right thing. Basically, thinking about core design. It doesn't mean core design of a very, very like a changing object, I mean, whatever you code it into some foreign code. I mean, core design from the data perspective how data is generated, how allocated, what kind of copy we have, and how many data we have. We have to think about that. Again, code is a new node, I mean, as, as we said, but M thread is not MPI process. I mean, process is very different from thread. And not take, uh, thinking that part very clearly will be a disadvantage. It will really you know, slow you down unnecessarily. So that's key part. And, and I think, you know, also, even though we are may suggesting code design, which could be daunting, but we are talking about the code design that is sort of a, you know, transformable on all the architecture we know of, except for very few architecture. So that's good. And third thing is, of course, you know, although we can make the code that can be transformed and portable on other architecture, even the performance portable in, in very widely. But at the same time, microarchitecture actually is important. And there are certain things you have to think about when you work on KNL or, and so on. So you should be thinking about that as well. I think I put the trademark wrong, but <laughs> Houseware is not KNL. Is a, 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 there are a lot of commonality, and you can do a lot of experiment. In a way, I didn't use KNC or KN at all, and I can just uh, safely make the projection because thread is thread and MPI is MPI. The the relative in the performance will change because open MP might be or should be much faster on KN versus uh, uh, hardware, but 
and the MPI versus OpenMP, there is uh, some differences between those two, but it is greater than one kind of relationship, and then we can generalize it. But at the same time, microarchitecture matters, how we really manage the memory and data is important, how we actually use the bandwidth and the, the cacheness, and numinous matters, you know. Four socket hardware are really more like a four node machine on a chip. While KNL, even <coughs> with all these complete uh, sort of uh, uh, the things you learn about, it is probably not a numa machine. You can safely assume that it's not a numa machine. You just use MPI because you can partition it and you can help it better. So that's one thing. And improved serial performance on KNL will be very helpful, but it's not going to magically remove the problem you have. So you have to make sure that you get rid of that, absolutely. So at this point, we will focus on these things. We are talking about general programming approach to recognize the distributed nature of current clusters uh, and the shared memory nature of the shared uh, clusters of SMP. And we are going to choose the right tool for the right thing. You know, chefs don't use one knife to cook. I mean, they have an array of knives to be able to deal with different parts and different, you know, <laughs> ingredients they were. It's like that. We can't just uh, use one dull knife to fix every problem. You make sure that you use the really good tool for the right level. If it happens to be really, really hard programming you have to do, if you are really going for performance, of course you should do that. I mean, you shouldn't stop at the genetic programming. So you will make sure. However, the design has to be flexible and adaptable. If you only use, you are saying is we are going to use MPI uh, distributed mem and shared memory, and we are going to use MPI to represent the distributed memory versus uh, the, the a thread for OpenMP. That means that all we are doing is through changing what you actually how you decompose the problem and how many threads you use at a given time. Otherwise, it's going to be a generic problem, and you have to make sure that it's adaptive. And of course, and then while working on this code design, we do everything we can to make sure that actually good programming practices are uh, reproduced, and that we just you know, don't be sloppy about doing that. So make sure that, and also it helps the people who are going to use your code so immensely, and then all everything, and definitely making pass a portable and performance portable code, and try to encapsulate the sort of targeted optimization as much as it can, meaning you have a sort of a identify some routine that really needs specialization on architecture. That can happen, and you can, you know, there are cases when really, really big difference between running on Xeon and Xeon Phi. In that case, what we should be ready to do, if that's really something that you uh, value to increase your performance and productivity, and you will actually encapsulate such that we can always swap in and out depending upon the architecture and then you know, sort of uh, hide from the complexity. You know. So that's the kind of thing we would do. So this is, so I will finish this part with this. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, okay, so this is from the group at Argon and who ported, uh, who redesigned, pretty much redesigned the, the astrophysics code on Blues and Q. And they really, the authors pretty much said all I wanted to say when we talk about this and the programming. Really, we have to think about the, uh, the reality of our current uh, HPC, and we can't just uh, hide that somehow you know, everything will be all right, and MPI will be magically good, and compilers will do a lot of things, and they, wherever data is, is not really important. I think you know we all know that it's really not true. As a, you know, as anybody who wrote the code and the tuned the code on a particular architecture, we know that. So we will have to just think about code design, not just the porting at some level. So of course you start with the porting and improving, and when you encounter the issues that appears to be some architectural issues and the code fundamental issues, then we should be also thinking, oh, let's rethink about it, and have we done the enough things to actually work on this kind of architecture? 
if you believe that it's going to be useful and in the portable, then I think we should do it. And I mean, there, there is a not such a big, dif a difficult task, and we will be, <laughs> and hopefully, we are all encouraged to be able to do that. So, for that, I think uh, I can finish the this section.